should have heard these presentations before, so sorry for um, doing it again. So before we start, a little bit about Innovate UK KTN. We exist to connect innovators with new partners and new opportunities beyond existing thinking. And this webinar series has been delivered as part of the programme Net Zero Places Innovation Network. So if you haven't already done so, please sign up and you'll get the latest information about all the activities we're doing, as our aim is to make help make Net Zero a reality by working with local and regional authorities and agencies to connect, collaborate, inform, share experiences, lessons to learn and adopt innovation to level up across the UK. Um, so this is why we're delivering this event series, this webinar series, but we couldn't do this on our own. So we've partnered up with the Greater South East Net Zero Hub. Um, They've been great in helping us identify the key themes and what they see as the challenges with local authorities. If you're not aware of the Net Zero Hubs, there are five located across England and they're central government funded to provide support for public sector to develop Net Zero projects up to the point of commercial investment. So they currently provide support for over 200 strategic projects and collect with a collective value of around 4 billion on a wide range of themes covering power generation, energy efficiency, heat decarbonisation. So if you have not got in touch with your net, local Net Zero Hub, please do drop me a line and I can make an introduction to them and they'll be able to support you on your Net Zero journey. So the purpose of this series is to answer the common questions and sharing good um, practice and experiences related to heating for Net Zero. And we've delivered a number so far. So we've delivered one on fabric efficiency, so fabric first, and the recording is available and heat pumps. And then the following ones, as you may have seen in the comms, um, we'll be looking at alternative energy. Well, today we'll be looking at alternative energy sources and then integrating the tech, technical modelling, grid constraint and horizon scanning. So please join us for any of the future activities. But again, please sign up for our um, Net Zero Place Innovation Network as you will then get the latest information of all the other activities. So let's crack on with this session. So we've got Malcolm first. Malcolm Farrow, um, are you able to take yourself mute? Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't see what means, so I can't see. Um, but Malcolm's the head of public affairs at Offtech and he'll be presenting the liquid biofuels and hybrid heat pumps. So Malcolm, over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, can you uh, move the slide on to the, the Offtech presentation, please? Great. And then just on to the first slide. That's it. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so for those of you that don't know about Oftech, uh, we're primarily a trade association. Uh, we represent uh, liquid fuel uh, manufacturers, primarily liquid fuel equipment manufacturers, and we also have close links to over 90 training providers. Um, I'm experiencing, the, uh, can you hear the noise in the background? It's a very loud uh, noise. So I'm sorry, it, 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 I don't know what's causing that. That's better. It seems to have gone now. There's some sort of interference. So apologies for that. Um, Alongside our, our work as a trade association, we also run a competent person registration scheme with about 9,500 heating technicians registered with us, primarily doing uh, oil heating, but also now increasingly doing other technologies like uh, heat pumps and biomass as well. Uh, and we, to, to facilitate their transfer into to those types of renewable equipment, we've uh, designed a new heat pump course now that's starting to be rolled out in the training centres we work with. Um, I'm here to tell you today about uh, our work on low carbon liquid fuels, and we've been working with a partnership of other uh, industry groups to, uh, develop, to develop the, the, the use of a fuel called HVO, which stands for hydro treated vegetable oil uh, in heating. And uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting opportunity, really, because it does offer a very significant uh, reduction in carbon emissions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so very, very briefly, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the, the challenges of net zero, um, but the, the key, obviously the key target is the goal of net zero by 2050, and there's a, a really very demanding interim target by 2035 that, that's uh, really designed to, to, to drive forward progress now so that we don't put things off. Um, heating is widely considered to be one of the toughest challenges in terms of decarbonising uh, uh, you the, the UK and uh, the two these two little graphs that I put up here are taken from the government's heat and building strategy which we published uh, in October last year. 
Um, heat accounts for roughly 23% of the UK's emissions. Uh, but um, the, the, the sector I'm particularly involved with, which is the off-grid sector, is a relatively small part of that. And you can see from the left-hand uh, chart that oil heating only accounts for roughly 4% of the emissions from, um, uh, uh, sorry, it's only 4% of homes actually in the UK have uh, uh, oil. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the, when the government published its heating building strategy, it also uh, published some consultations on uh, its initial plans, which were uh, around the, uh, the phasing out of uh, high carbon fossil fuels off the gas grid. Um, and the approach they're taking is to uh, uh, replace those with heat pumps where uh, they, what they call reasonably practical. And the, the way that will be done is by regulation supported by incentives and uh, another uh, sort of policy scheme called the market mechanism. Um, and the timetable for, for this is really quite demanding with uh, large off-grid uh, buildings. And I, I've, I've talked about homes and businesses, but it also does include public sector buildings. Uh, so, so larger buildings from 2024, uh, new build from 2025, and domestic and smaller non-domestic buildings from 2026. Um, and from those dates, uh, the government has proposed that you won't be able to install a high carbon fossil fuel system. And the expectation is that you will instead have to fit, uh, in most cases, a heat pump. And the government thinks that around 80% of off-grid homes uh, are technically suitable for a heat pump with only radiators being resized. Um, and they also think, uh, and I think this is really quite a striking uh, point, that uh, the reason they think this is a particularly appropriate uh, approach is that they expect the price of heat pumps to fall by 50% uh, by 2025. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? This is all by way of background. I'm not going to go into the policy analysis in detail, but um, I do think that the, 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 the question about whether uh, the price of heat pumps is likely to fall to that extent is a really very moot point. Uh, the current price for the uh, for the meeting, the average price of heat pumps under the new boiler upgrade scheme is coming in at nearly £13,000, which is actually quite a bit higher uh, than the, the average price for RHI installs. So in actual fact, the price of the heat pump system seems to be going up rather than down. And um, you know, I think that's really a, a big area of concern. And most of the government's thinking around uh, its proposals for off-grid were developed before the COVID crisis and obviously much before the, the current uh, cost of living crisis that we're seeing. So I, I really do think that there is uh, significant scope for a bit of a rethink, actually. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, um, Oftech and some other industry groups have been working on um, other alternatives really to the, to the government's proposed strategy for off-grid. I mean, we're absolutely behind the idea of using heat pumps where they're, they're the most appropriate solution. And we really think that uh, a lot of uh, buildings on the gas grid actually are probably more suitable than uh, rural uh, buildings because they're typically older, less energy efficiency and harder to treat. Um, so we, we advocate a more technology neutral approach, and that's where uh, we think that re uh, renewable liquid fuels could play a really significant role. Um, and the one that we're particularly focused on is a, a fuel called hydro treated vegetable oil. Um, we initially looked at um, fame based biofuels, but we found that there were significant issues in terms of the storage of that type of fuel because it's not really suited for long term storage at lower temperatures. So uh, we, we felt that HVO is a much better bet, really. Um, and that's what I'm here to tell you about today, really. So next slide. So the key benefits of HVO is that um, it's produced entirely from waste, uh, at least all of the, the HVO that's imported into the UK is. It's primarily uh, produced from uh, uh, waste uh, cooking oil, uh, but you can use other types of biogenic waste. Uh, and it's 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 fully certified and considered as sustainable and renewable by um, the ISCC. Um, you can make other very similar fuels to HVO using a wide variety of other waste streams, including household waste. But at the moment, HVO is the one that we're primarily most interested in. Um, it offers a really striking uh, reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions compared to kerosene, a reduction of 88%, which is you know, actually higher than heat pumps can currently achieve, although eventually heat pumps will obviously surpass that as the, uh, the, the electricity generation in the UK becomes increasingly decarbonised. But at the moment, HVO uh, is, is superior in that sense. Um, 
it offers a direct replacement for heating oil. I mean, uh, HVO is actually a type of renewable diesel, but uh, it's a paraffinic fuel and you can drop it, effectively use it as a straight replacement. Um, we find that uh, existing oil heating systems require relatively modest modifications to use um, HVO. It takes no more than two hours. We, we advocate cleaning the tank and uh, there's a few modifications to boiler itself. But in most cases, it's very easy to make that, that conversion and it's, it costs typically less than 500 pounds to do that per house. So it's again, much cheaper and less intrusive than and disruptive than uh, virtually any other um, conversion to low carbon heating. And that's a really big plus because uh, it really protects the householder from uh, significant uh, disruption and from, from cost, obviously. Um, and it then works exactly like the existing heating system. Once HBO is, 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 is being used as the fuel, the householder will notice no difference at all. Uh, it's, it's effectively exactly the same. Um, but HVO can, you know, fuel systems using HVO can be combined with hybrid systems of various kinds. And I'll tell you a little bit about the work that's going on there a bit later on in my presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, we're currently running uh, a quite a long, detailed uh, demonstration project. This has been going on for two years, and uh, we've converted run, around about 120 plus buildings now. Her co workers uh, noticed something was amiss when she began stuttering and temporarily lost vision. Oh, it's another, another voice on the. Oh, well, anyway, I don't know who's, who that is, but anyway. Um, We've got, yeah, we've got about 120 homes or so on the trial and, and some non-domestic buildings as well. Uh, those have included a school and a pub and a church, so a wide variety of buildings. And we've used this, this trial to, to really test and thoroughly understand how to, to use HVO um, in the real world. And we're, we're absolutely satisfied now that uh, we've, we've got the level of understanding now to, to roll out uh, this type of fuel at scale. Uh, and... Uh, you know, the, the results have been extremely positive. The people who have been using the, the fuel are, are very keen to, to, to use it. They're very happy with the, the way it's gone. And although we have had some minor um, sort of technical issues that we've, we've come across, you know, this is an important part of the sort of understanding process and they're things that have now been overcome. So, you know, we're really very happy that it's a, a, it's a very good solution and a very reliable solution for, uh, for rural buildings. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this, this is just a few pictures from the from the the, the scheme, and uh, you know it, it's it's. I think one of the really striking things about this project is that typically uh, in the oil heating sector, uh, fuel distributors uh, are are strong competitors with one another, and the same is true of manufacturers. But because uh, this trial needed a really collaborative approach, we've all worked together extremely well, and I think that speaks volumes for the. Uh, commitment of our sector to actually make this happen. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm afraid you know, most of what I've said hasn't been directly related to the public sector, but I thought I would very briefly mention that the Northern Ireland Housing Executive is currently undergoing a, a small HBO trial and they fitted, I think, three homes with a hybrid system consisting of a HBO boiler with an air source heat pump system. And as part of our trial, we've also had a high, one, one home was converted with a hybrid system as well. And again, we're very happy that this, this approach is a, is a good one and uh, it does work extremely well. When the, um, the housing executive set this, this trial up, they were expecting that the uh, heat pump would work uh, to temperatures down to five centigrade, below which uh, the, the oil boiler would, 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 would come in and, uh, and do more of the work to heat the home. But in, in fact, the, the, the trials, and they, they, because of this, they expected that the, uh, the, the heat pump would, would, would be actually dominating the heating system and the oil boiler would be used very, very little, in fact. But the, the reality is that it, it doesn't seem to have quite worked out like that. And many of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the households out of the, that three were very, you know, were using the boiler more than the, the, the executive expected. And we, we don't know the full reason for that. But... I know that the, the trial had, a, I think, a budget of £20,000 per home for the, the retrofit, and roughly half of that was spent on the air source heat pump, and the rest was used for uh, sort of relatively modest energy efficiency improvements to the, uh, the, the building itself. So it may well be that, that um, heat loss is, a, is still an issue for those homes, and that's why the oil boiler is being used more to, to actually generate more heat. Um, so next slide, please. Now, it all sounds 
wonderful, doesn't it? But there is a slight problem. The first one is that oil is uh, HVO is significantly more expensive uh, currently than heating oil, and it's also taxed differently. So it, 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 there's more duty payable on HVO. And part of this is because the government currently is, is, hasn't made a decision yet about whether HVO should be made available for heating or whether it should be reserved for use for transport. And you know, obviously, when you've got a, a finite resource, uh, you have to make some quite difficult policy decisions about this. Um, but if you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, we, we basically uh, are proposing that the government should extend the existing RTFO scheme to create a, a more consistent incentive framework to support HVO irrespective of use. And um, if that were done and uh, if the, uh, the, the, the issues around the duty were also uh, dealt with, the cost of HVO would really be very close to, to kerosene, which would then make it a very practical option for heating. And there, there is a further thing that the government could do, which is to remove the trade barriers that are currently preventing HVO being imported from outside of the EU. And were that done, uh, that would create a more um, a better market for HVO in the UK. It would increase supply and it would also uh, uh, improve competition, which would actually have the effect of bringing the price down. Uh, and I think that's the end of my presentation. Next slide. Yeah, there we are. Um, there's more that you, if you want to find out more about this, uh, visit the uh, Future Ready Fuel website. Uh, I have to say it is aimed largely at consumers, but there is plenty of good information there about HBO and the work we're doing. And uh, you know, I'm obviously very happy to answer questions and uh, you're welcome to contact me offline um, if you'd like to know more. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, I'll stop sharing now. That was a very insightful presentation. So that, really appreciate that. Um, let me just get my next slide up for my introduction. So next up, we've got John, who's from the Greater Southeast Net Zero Hub, who will be sharing um, who will be sharing some case studies on what other local authorities or other groups have done in regards to alternative fuels. So, John, I see your presentation is up, so you're on mute though. So if you'd like to take yourself on mute and you're ready to go. Great, thank you, Neelam, and um, yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'll be covering uh, a few more alternative fuels, um, moving on from the liquid form of biomass um, into solid wood fuel, and I'll be covering some biogas um, solutions as well. Um, just commenting on the um, hybrid heat pump setup, I know that I think Lord Deben, who chairs the Climate Change Committee, has recently fitted a hybrid um, bio LPG system in his home. So he's there's also biopropane um, sitting alongside a heat pump as an option um, as well. So moving on. There we go. Yeah, so um, I work for the Greater Southeast Net Zero Hub. Um, we're a base funded organisation that works with local authorities to help scale up um, delivery of local energy and net zero projects. Um, we're one of five um, hub teams across England, so we have similar colleagues acting in the Midlands, Southwest, Northwest and Northeast. Um, so um, in terms of other alternative fuels available to um, the public and local authorities, um, one that's been pretty well established in the area of, um, in the sector for quite a while is um, wood fuel. Um, yeah, quite a historic fuel, um, quite widely used on the continent as well um, in Scandinavia and Austria for heating. Um, so this is largely um, the ideal sort of carbon cycle um, you in, represented in the diagram here. Um, a nice, well managed uh, woodland uh, coppice there. Um, with the kind of fuel being then processed from logs into wood chips in the top corner um, delivery to then hopefully not too far to a, a building with a biomass boiler where the wood fuel is there converted into heat and then uh, the kind of carbon from the emissions of burning the fuel go up into the atmosphere and then are then re-sequestered or um, by any regrowth within the woodland so hopefully creating a closed loop and sustainable cycle um, uh, for the fuel processing there. Um, I think roughly in uh, it's around 250,000 hectares of um, unmanaged native woodland um, in the UK, which could be um, improved and brought back into management. Um, 
uh, as well as creating all sorts of biodiversity benefits um, just through um, kind of better management of habitats within woodland as well. Um, we also we recently rebranded from energy hubs to net zero hubs so we know a lot of local authorities are also looking at uh, tree planting schemes as forms of carbon offsetting um, and it's often questioned well if we're planting trees to offset carbon um, isn't it a bit counterproductive to be cutting them down and burning them well that's the thing with any form of woodland management um, you are going to get some thinnings at some point um, ideally, you want to keep the wood in solid form, going into other products, building materials, things like that. But you're always going to get some residue, which will end up being either composted or burnt. So, um, yeah, we're kind of focusing on the, that end of the chain, the kind of very sustainable um, supply chain model there. And just in terms of the picture there, um, I think like some local authorities like Suffolk in particular have got a very well established programme of fitting biomass boilers. Um, into some of their rural schools as an alternative to heating oil um, and yeah other local authorities um, it's obviously more of a rural fuel solution than an urban one but yeah it's very suitable for things like leisure centres, schools and those sorts of applications. Um, in terms of pricing um, yeah we can see in the chart at the top here the kind of historic comparable pricing of various forms of wood fuel compared to gas, oil and electricity um, obviously, the less processed a fuel is, um, the cheaper it is. Um, like wood pellets are probably most comparable to heating oil. They're an internationally traded commodity. So um, the graph you can see at the bottom there is what's happened to heating oil prices over the, um, the last two years. Um, and I haven't found a similar chart for wood fuel, but I would suspect certainly wood pellets would follow a similar pattern as heating oil. Um, uh, demand rises as does so does demand for wood pellets and the price tracks accordingly. Where local authorities have an advantage I think is um, in wood chips and wood logs so where you've kind of got your own land management and estates that are being managed you're producing your own wood chips and wood thinnings then keeping that within kind of circularly within your estates and um, that gives you an advantage at the moment of certainly of a cost um, advantage over heating oil, which is now currently around 9p a kilowatt hour, and yet gas is yeah even higher than that at the moment. Although long term, hopefully that will come back down into more um, reasonable areas. But yeah, certainly if you're in control of an area to grow wood and process it, um, and then supply it into your buildings, then yeah, it could well be worth considering, um, not just for carbon, but for the running costs and resilience as well. So. A few of the pros and cons. Um, yeah, its advantage is it produces a high temperature heat compared to heat pumps, which is more suitable for buildings that have limited opportunities to retrofit the fabric. Um, so yeah, we see it quite commonly in uh, rural kind of listed conservation areas and estates. Um, I mentioned the biodiversity benefits. Uh, coppice woodland is a yeah, great habitat um, and for increasing biodiversity. Um, yeah, and also it's quite labour intensive. You need people um, to manage all the new woodlands that are being created. And by having wood fuel as a potential income stream, then that creates sustainable income and livelihoods to keep people employed rather than relying on volunteers. Um, again, local authorities have parkland, they have farmland, hedgerows. Um, also, just the opportunity to create um, uh, Waste collection stations. Uh, I know some local authorities in London and Manchester create tree waste stations where um, tree surgeons and other um, people in an area can uh, bring their wood um, kind of pro for processing and uh, um, yeah into a central location, which is then efficiently um, converted into all sorts of useful products, including wood fuel. Um, we've heard the advantages of it being used in a hybrid setup to kind of get the best of both worlds of heat pump and electrification with um, the kind of peak winter loads being bet my my but by my biomass. <laughs> um, it's currently eligible for the public sector decarbonisation scheme as well. So um, see it right at the top of the cons there it is still a high capital cost um, thing to invest in uh, comparable boilers to oil yeah you are going to be paying more for them as they're kind of a bit more precise engineering involved um, as well as yeah 
to get the best out of them, you do need to have someone overseeing them, maintaining them, which adds to overheads and labour costs. Um, where we've seen local authorities have issues with them in the past, it's where um, the like the quality of the wood fuel is really critical for um, making sure that they operate efficiently and um, limit kind of uh, failures and uh, breakages. So well, we've found them they work best where the team that procure and manage the boilers are also the team that procure and manage the fuel as well. So keeping it all kind of centrally coordinated where you start divesting roles out into different parts of the organisation that don't talk to one another. For example, one team manages and maintains them, another team is responsible for ordering the fuel, then that's where you start to get kind of yeah problems coming in in terms of poor quality fuel, reducing efficiency, causing damage, and then you see all the cost savings being cannibalised into just repairing them and having backup systems in place. Um, yeah, we're more commonly seeing air pollution and health quality issues um, yeah, coming much more to the fore now, um, particularly urban areas. Um, it's definitely something to be aware of. Um, if you do have more centralised biomass burning plant, then you do have the option of um, emitting uh, or kind of fitting um, emission control solutions to the flues um, more than dispersed solutions. Um, and then, yeah, there is a bit of a preview for a future um, webinar series, but they still emit CO2. So are there solutions about carbon capture and storage in the future? We'll come up to that in another webinar. Um, in terms of sourcing fuel, that icon at the bottom there is the biomass suppliers list. Um, under the renewable heat incentive, um, this was set up to ensure that um, sustainable good quality fuel was going into boilers supported through that scheme so that still exists um, yeah and you can see there it's kind of benchmarked on a minimum co2 saving compared to the fossil fuel alternative okay and uh, moving on to uh, the gaseous forms of fuel um, uh, biomethane is another um, alternative fuel where local authorities can have quite a bit of influence um, in its production and generation and use. So um, broadly, again, the cycle um, in its most sustainable form is taking uh, biomass waste, food waste, um, sending it to an anaerobic digestion plant where um, it gets fermented and broken down um, anaerobically, mimicking the kind of biological process in a cow's stomach. Um, breaks it down into yeah, various physical components, um, bioliquids, but also that biogas. Um, in this uh, situation, you can either um, clean it up, use it locally for electricity or CHP generation. But um, when it comes to heating in particular, um, uh, biomass, um, upgrading it into cleaner biomethane, um, just so it's comparable with the gas in the national gas grid. Um, you can then inject that gas into the gas networks and have that virtually piped around the system to your own facilities again um, and then combusted in the boiler. So um, by having that option of having a remote facility producing biogas, injecting it into the gas grid means you do have the option of procuring um, through uh, your energy suppliers um, natural gas um, that is backed up by something called the Green Gas Certification Scheme. So like you can procure electricity that's backed up by renewable electricity generation certificates, um, you can have the same for biogas production as well. So you can net off your organisation's heating gas use against certified biogas that's been injected into the gas network grid at some point. And that's done through this Green Gas Certification Scheme um, to kind of guarantee that what you're buying is additional kind of uh, carbon negative or car carbon neutral gas. Um, so by yeah, by paying a premium um, versus the kind of standard uh, gas contracts, you can have uh, yeah, the same quantity of certificates allocated to your account. And that means when you come to your annual greenhouse gas reporting, you can retire those certificates and show that um, yeah, your organisation has um, yeah, led to some carbon savings according to the greenhouse gas protocol through the use of biomethane. Um, so that's a very useful um, uh, short to medium term mechanism, I think, for local authorities to consider. Um, 
in terms of the pros and cons, pretty similar to uh, the bio, uh, the wood fuel again there. Um, I think one of the biggest pros is um, you can make use of council waste. Um, council's responsible for waste collections, um, both from homes and businesses. There's an opportunity there to, yeah, uh, procure this fuel at source and take it to a centralised location for conversion into fuel and energy. Um, again, slightly high capital costs, but again, potential advantages if you can keep all that waste and cost within your um, own kind of organization's ecosystem. Um, there's a question about how scalable some of these biofuels are if we're relying purely on waste sources and the sustainability of relying on um, waste, um, well, additional feedstocks. Um, there's certainly opportunities from the private sector to get more wastes in, but um, yeah, we're seeing quite a few kind of pure dedicated bio crops being grown to go into this. Um, so that's an angle to consider. Um, anaerobic digestion plants do require a pretty consistent, stable feedstock 12 months all the year round, really. So um, that's something to consider as the kind of and a footprint of where you're drawing the feedstock on and the different sources you can to get a reliable production throughout the year. Um, again, a question as well. Um, does it potentially have more use as a vehicle fuel? We know um, some organisations are looking at this to run their uh, waste collection vehicles as an alternative to heating, so CNG in engines. Um, so to summarise, I think key roles for local authorities um, with biomethane, uh, certainly the opportunity for the waste collections for food waste, um, budgets for dedicated food waste collections would be welcome to accelerate work in this area. Um, we are also talking with other councils who are interested in other areas they manage, like potential use of grass clippings from parks and verges as a feedstock for biogas as well. Um, local authorities have the potential to co-locate biogas plants at other waste processing facilities and hubs and depots. Um, yeah, and there's just like the economic opportunity of investing in uh, plants um, themselves, like Councils invest in other forms of renewable energy like solar. Um, this is yeah similar opportunity there. And again, procurement of green gas certificates to net off your organisation's gas use um, again uh, as a means of working towards your net zero targets. Um, I think we did mention in the blurb for this we might talk about solar thermal. Um, so I think we're not got the time to do that today, but it will be raised at the next webinar. Um, so certainly about integrating the tech. Here's an example of the University of West London who've um, in, got a solar PV and combined thermal array on their roof. Um, so we'll be talking about as we integrate various technologies together next time. OK. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, that was a great presentation, gave you some food for thought. We've got had a few questions in the chat, so please have a look at that, John, and um, okay. maybe answer them. Um, next up, we've got Julian Reed. Um, I've seen that Julian's joined the call um, from Cool University, um, and Julian will be sharing the hydrogen blending trial that's being done. Um, Julian sits on the steering group for high deploy at university representatives and program manage Keel's smart energy network demonstrator. So, Julian, are you OK That's to correct. share your screen or share your presentation? Yeah, I'll ju yeah, just give me a second to do a screen share. Give me a second. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, yeah, again, if you'd like to, if you've got any questions, please just pop in the chat. We are collating them so then we can ask as many as we can afterwards. And if there's any that we couldn't answer, we'll make sure that they're circulated. Um, and if you weren't a part of the initial um, intro, the presentations will be shared. The recording of the presentations will be shared. The Q&A will not be recorded, um, but the information will be shared after the 23rd. Um, cool. So, Julian, I can see your presentation okay. now. Um, so are you ready to go? Yeah, fine, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sharing on my iPad, so I seem to have lost <laughs> my, my own little image as well, but ne never mind. OK, so um, so I, I'm Julian Reader, as, as introduced program manager for the Smart Energy Network uh, demonstration. I'm going to try and keep uh, this presentation down to 10, 10 to 15 minutes, even though I, I do do a lengthier version. But what I will do is, is run through uh, some of the um, 
opportunities that Keyloft's created itself and some of the projects that we've done that have enabled us to, to, to uh, deliver our, our hydroflow program with partners. So, so in terms of the university, uh, the university itself has been working on its, its smart energy and its sustainability timeline since 2008. And, and the projects I'm going to talk about today were in development in 2008-9 time, uh, came to you know, physical delivery in 2016-17, and are now on site in 2020, 21 and 22. So there's a lot of development gone into to the projects that I'm going to talk about today and, and a lot of research which was which has taken place. So to generate the university's energy, uh, we have on site at the moment uh, just over 12,500, 450 watts. Uh, uh, solar panels and two wind turbines, which which is giving Keele University um, on a bad day somewhere in the region of 50% of its energy. On a very good day, we're struggling to, with the, the management of that excess energy, but that's also given us the opportunity to uh, to generate hydrogen. So that, that hydrogen fuel we're looking to generate through that excess energy through a, an on-site electrolyzer. Uh, there's a big project presentation on this project slide alone, so I'm just going to skip on to keep to me 10 minutes. So a management of our energy comes through our smart energy network demonstrator. Um, the smart energy network demonstrator is a program of 60 million pounds in, in total. We run that over five years. Uh, the majority of the fund has gone into the capital side of it, but we have run and organized uh, research projects where we've delivered 16 PhDs, uh, supported around about 270 businesses um, um, in this sort of local economy and, and delivered short, sharp uh, projects with, a, with the local organisations. And four of those have received uh, Queen's Awards for Innovation. But the major target I have from, from this is to achieve a carbon saving. Um, I'm, I'm targeted to report around about four tonnes of carbon saving per year. Uh, last year, we reported 5,700 metric tons. Uh, in the first quarter this year, we've done 1,700 tons. So, so we're on target for that. But uh, I, th I think what I'm trying to show is, uh, is the process in terms of energy and how we manage it. Manage it. Uh, our cat capital system of SEND controls all the university's energy. We meter everything. It can, we have our BMS systems control, uh, control the meter to our, our Siemens systems as part of SEND. And we have every element of control across the university so we can uh, adapt our um, our energy uh, usage at any point during the day to make sure that we are uh, either uh, efficient around carbon or we, or we, or we can lower our costings um, it's it's again great presentation in itself but but this this enables us to, to manage our energy systems so now on to the main project that we came, came to talk about today how deploy so you can see that we've got a our energy generation from a from a solar and wind uh, managed through a send system. Um, so we were asked as a university if we would be prepared to partner as part of a, an off-gen project uh, with, with Cadent and Northern Gas Networks in terms of hard deploy. Now the the, the project itself was to to look at the uh, blending of 20% hydrogen into the university's network. Um, the project funded by um, Ofgem, uh, eight million pounds in terms of funding, and the two network operators engaged, Northern Gas Networks, Caden, uh, really interested because obviously they're looking at the, the future of gas in terms of grass going green. Um, what we had to do in terms of the, the university was to deliver uh, an exceptional safety case, and the safety case was developed with the HSE, with the university's estates team, but also with the support of technical partners, Progressive Energy, and, and ITM Power who supported us with a, an, an electrolyzer, which we have on site and, and still have on site. So, so the university um, started to look at this as, as a project, uh, recognized that the safety case was huge. And when you start to look at the gas regulations which are in place, um, there was about two years worth of work to achieve that safety case before we could take it forward. Much of the work was done in collaboration with all of that team, including Pro Progressive, Cadent, Northern Gas Networks, and, and even simple things around you know, how, we, how we would manage the energy within our gas grid uh, had to be an analysed. Um, we had to test every boiler on site. We had to test a piping uh, to make sure everything was safe. We've got everything from old, old cast iron pipes up to, up to modern pipes. Uh, 
we, we had to look at how we could actually measure the hydrogen throughout the uh, university's campus. So we had gas chromatography littered all over the site to make sure we had a, a, a stable environment for hydrogen to be injected. Uh, one thing that we didn't realise before we before we moved the project forward was actually the dramatic and quite rapid change in gas pressures. So a huge amount of research had to be uh, input into the creation of a, a, a grid entry unit, which was done with a company called Tyson, and we have one of those on site still. So in, in terms of the university itself, um, I think if, if you look at this, uh, there's a huge amount of work undertaken just over two years worth of development of the safety case. The safety case had to be approved by the HSE, and we had to make sure we'd got all the technology in place prior to running the trial. Um, why blending is, is a big question, really. And I think the, I know that the UK government is looking at blending, potentially blending of hydrogen into the gas grid, uh, potentially as a transition stage. And the equivalent of taking two and a half million cars off the road will be achieved by black blending hydrogen into the UK gas grid. But clearly, before we do that, that we have to make sure we are we address first of all the supply of hydrogen in, in that being it's green and it's affordable and it's developed in a safe safe manner for systems. So so that's um, there's three big questions there still to be addressed before this can be taken forward. But the UK government are looking at blending as a as a case and are supposed to be coming back to us with a, a but with an, an agreement to do that sometime next year. So there's a, so, so a lot of thought going on this. And the partners of this team are actively working with the UK government to, to say that, you know, we've achieved a lot of the um, constraints required to take this forward and working with Ofgen as well. Um, so what did we do with the trial at Kiel? Um, you can just about to see the, the compound there. So we supported the trial by delivering um, a blend of hydrogen into 100 homes on the Keel University campus. Uh, we have um, separate individual residential uh, buildings, uh, so we have people living on site. Also, 30 university buildings, so those those facilities were supplied with a blend of hydrogen. Prior to doing so, we did a huge amount of work with the residents to make sure that they understood what was going on, that they understood the safety case. And as part of the program of work, we did a lot around the behavioral aspects of the trials so they could understand uh, what we were doing, why we were doing and how safe it was. To begin with, as you would expect, there were some concerns, but as the project went forward, that they recognized that a gas was a gas, it was being delivered safety, safely within a network which had been tested and, and they were quite comfortable in, in receiving that trial. Um, so successfully delivered on the Keel side was the was all the safety case for um, for high deploy, the fact that we developed the technology to, to deliver it safely, uh, that we delivered it through a, a grid entry unit and that we generated through an electrolyzer. The second part of the trial that was supported again by all the program team was a, a live demonstration in an area of Gateshead at Wynn Leighton. Um, on that, from the Wynn Leighton trial, which is only just finished recently, um, 668 homes, a school, as you can see there, were receiving hydrogen as part of the trial. Again, resident surveys took place, and this project was run by Northern Gas Networks with uh, the rest of the program in collaboration with Northern Gas Networks. Keel supported the project again by continuing with resident surveys and supporting the technology. Uh, the, the, in terms of the re resident surveys, very similar to what happened at Keel, uh, we found that the residents showed a lot of concerns to begin with, and then as we move forward, um, they. they uh, we're, we're satisfied that this moves safely forward. Um, not just the work that we did at Keel and, and, and this uh, presentation, sorry, and the delivery in Gateshead, we've done work with an industrial base. Um, so the, the two big trials that I always call on are um, from an architectural glass uh, perspective, uh, we did a lot of work with uh, Pilkington's. Uh, a five day trial was run with Pilkington's on a 55 megawatt gas furnace where a blend of hydrogen was introduced into Pilkington's manufacturing. Again, this successfully proved that um, the hydrogen blend could operate within that gas furnace and the product was successfully manufactured. And, and local to Keel is the ceramic industry. So I always mention this one, but it's, we are still continuing with trials with the ceramic industry and the, the ceramic industry itself um, is looking at how hydrogen can affect its manufacturing. So not, not just bricks, tiles and refractory products, but also the ceramic sector. And, and as I know, because I came from that sector myself, that um, 
that there are um, uh, sensitivities around kiln conditions which can affect, affect product. So I think all, all in all to say is that in terms of the high deployed program, uh, a huge amount of development took place at Keel in terms of developing the safety case and the, um, the, the work which was undertaken supported uh, an active and live trial and one late as a blend. Um, the facilities still exist at Keel, even, even though our electrolyzer is turned off at the moment to, to, to reignite that project. Um, and, we, and we've done a huge amount of work with industry, so a very successful project. Um, more recently, we've received a lot of interest from overseas, so we've had uh, a delegation from India, uh, some big organisations called to visit us and interested in running a very similar trial in, uh, in Kashmir. And uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've had visitors from Argentina asking very similar questions and how could they introduce a, a blend. So for, for me, I've tried to keep to uh, just about my 10 minutes, I think, in terms of a, a project presentation today. Uh, there are many questions that I, I guess will have been raised around this. I'm happy to support those either taking today or perhaps taking uh, uh, online at a, at a later date.